Hi everyone, my name is Sharon Richardson. Uh, my company is Joining Dot, so I've got it on the slide, so that should do. Um, normally we do a slide about me. I personally never bother. If you like what I've got to say today, then afterwards I'd love to talk more about it. So we'll leave it at that. I've got about 20 years experience that's been clocked up now over a range of technologies and solutions, but I've always been in the arena of knowledge management, collaborative communications, the people side of technology. It was never cool in the 90s, it has to be said. Trying to get budget for Lotus Notes to do stuff was quite hard. It's like, it's a bit soft. These days, of course, now everybody's a social media consultant and it's all changed. We're a lot more... ..take a more people-focused approach to a lot of what I say. We have got a three-parter coming up, which means I'm going to be doing more talking than I'd like, and it sounded like a good idea on paper before Christmas, but I may go a bit hoarse by the end. I've done some little handouts, which are just the highlight points, because I always think the best thing at a conference is to have the chance to ask questions. So I'm going to try not to just talk, talk, talk solid all the way through and leave plenty of time after each part for questions at the end. The one rule I would ask is because it's me talking all the way through, I will do a hard stop for the breaks just so that I can catch my breath, get the next step ready and just get a bit organised. So whereas sometimes it's nice to ask questions after the session, if you really want to have some one-on-one -on -one questions, please leave those right till the end of the third part. And I will stay as long as there's somebody that's got a question that they want answered. But in the breaks, if you could just give me that breathing space, it'd be much appreciated. It is a three-parter. They are three discrete things, although there's a common theme and certain slides will reappear in different sections as we hopefully tie it all together. This session, part one, all about the organisation perspective. Why have an internet? Why bother? And the question I often get asked by my clients is, well, how much is it going to cost me? What's it going to cost to do this? The bigger question that I often push back is whether or not what people are asking for is feasible. And it's a question I think is quite important early on in the project. It's where we get a lot of misaligned expectations. Fourth part in this first session, it, why SharePoint? I, it's a SharePoint conference, so we probably ought to at least ask the question and address a little bit about the technology. But I should emphasise most of what I'm going to say today is really focused around the solutions rather than the specific technologies. So you could apply a lot of this advice, obviously, to other areas as well. But we will talk about SharePoint too, a little. First up, this applies to any project internet, anything, personal, you might have a personal goal, always you have to have these three elements if you want to succeed. And most projects fail because they lack one of them. Missing any one element will just slow down the decision-making process and reduce the potential outcome. You've got to have a problem to solve, otherwise why are you doing it? But just having a problem isn't enough if there isn't that commitment to change. You know, if, that, if that's all it were, everyone would have stopped smoking the minute people found there were health risks concerned with it. Yet some people chose not to. They had no commitment to make the change. They had reasons not to change. It's their life, they're fully entitled to. But without that commitment, nothing changes. And then the big in, it's a big ask, it has to be said around a lot of SharePoint projects, sufficient resources to actually bring that change about. Have you got sufficient resources for what you're trying to do? And that's going to be the frame for this session. So, what problem will an intranet solve? Anyone want to give it a go? What problem are we facing? Anyone? Say again? Communication. Yeah, communication is the biggie. For being the first person to speak out, you get the sixth clock. Come and grab it at the end of the session. <laughs> Thank you. It's the only one, by the way, if everybody yeah. speaks up next. So, yeah, communications is always the foundation. But it's spreading, spreading a lot. You know, define the word intranet. Yeah, it's a bit like the internet. Some people use phrases like interwebs these days, you know, because it's become to mean so many different things. You, know, you can't really have this one definition fits all. You could argue exactly the same is true for internet. It usually does start with communication. We've got some company news, some media. We like to share the company's performance. There's been some awards, the employee of the month. All about communication. And it's usually about the health of the company, making people aware of what's going on. It's communication. That's just one aspect. The next biggie that typically comes is documents. We can't find anything, so we need an enterprise search solution. We'll put all the documents there, we'll index them, we'll search them. When I find the one I'm looking for, I'll bookmark it. I might put some tags on it so I can find it again. I might share it with other people. But the challenge is we always have many documents, but it's actually one specific document that I'm looking for, and it needs to be the right document. And that's true for everyone. So everyone's specific document is often a different one. Then there's a third aspect. We're going into the world of tasks. There's processes to complete. I need to book my travel. I need to submit my expenses. 
I always, I'm, I put the umbrella on because for some reason a lot of people feel the weather forecast is a good thing to have on the home page. Don't know if that's particularly just a British thing because it mostly happens over here, but we're possessed by the weather. But it's all about tasks, getting stuff done. And then, of course, there's the fourth and the big option, and it's the people. I need to find people as much as I need to find documents. Who are they? What do they do? Can we, do they have expertise that can help me? Will they give me advice? You know, a recommendation, always stronger than reading static words. Conversations start, then we start recording our own blogs, webcasts, media, and the communication department hates it because now it's no longer a formal process. Everybody's doing it. But it's all about ideas. We're moving from you know, the health of the company, round documents, into processes, to sharing ideas, potentially looking to innovate, inspire people to do things differently. But if you're tackling all of these at once, that's a big, big project. And what I rarely see in internet projects is people articulating which area of this, beyond communications, and it's a good answer because that's always, almost always the starting point. Be quite clear about, well, what aspect are we talking about here? And it might be you start at one end and you slowly work through and deliver more solutions on top, but define the problem and what you're trying to do with it. So let's take one, because it gives me a first stop for a drink. Social media, it's a popular topic, and I need to try. There we go. made me chuckle. <laughs> Obviously, that's a bit of a parody of social media, but it's got a point at the heart of it. Is that, yes, social media and social tools are great, but without a purpose, they don't actually deliver that much. And if I look at a lot of people's efforts with social tools in their business, they're often experimenting, trying them out, but without really any clear purpose. And if you don't have a purpose, you will just add expense to the business, which is not usually a happy outcome for the people that write the checks. So an alternate Let's pick a case study. PwC in Switzerland. Not my case study. This is available on the internet, so I just nicked somebody's blog post. But it's a really useful point. They decided they wanted a social intranet. You know, they don't talk about any other aspects of their intranet, whether it's got processes, content. They just talked about the need to be social. And they came to this belief that they needed to shift. You know, the home page no longer matters. People arrive at different places on the internet, and they start from different places. You can't have this assumption they're all going to start from the home page. And they are not the audience anymore. They're participants. It's not a broadcast medium anymore. It's a dialogue. But remember, this is just taking that one strand and thinking about it from a social perspective. And it's really interesting, because when you look at the size, of, they're a big company, 180,000 effectively knowledge workers. I added that bit in, but you know, what they do is around knowledge. They're 40,000 new hires every year, which is just phenomenal. And the average global workforce age is 27, which is amazingly young, actually. I would have thought it would have been higher than that uh, these days. But this quote really sums it up. You know, everything that is not fully dynamic is simply too slow to support our business anymore. And that was the problem they were going to solve. And they built these beliefs, and they communicated the hex out of them at the start, throughout, all the way through the project. They had this focus. The beauty of having a vision that you've shared is that you get everyone on that same path. It's brilliant for conflict resolution because whenever somebody comes up with what if, what if we did this, what if we did that, you know, what ifs can lead you down to a path of nowhere if you're not careful because anything's technically possible and software's involved. But you go, well, does it help the vision? Does it move it in the right direction or does it deflect? Does it distract? Does it take us down a different path? And that brings everyone back together. Now, I can't emphasize enough, if you don't have that strong vision to start with, what are you going to end up with? You, you, you don't know, and that's a problem when you're spending money in the process. Of course, part of that, too, 
is going, well, what are the benefits? You know, what are we expecting to happen? You know, what's going to be good about this new project, this new intranet? Um, this picture I thought was stunning. I actually just saw it a couple of weeks ago and instantly thought, that's going on a slide for somebody. But actually, it's completely the wrong picture for this talk. Why? Anybody want to guess? Nothing really has changed. You know, I should have done a catafit pillar to a butterfly, a metamorphosis. This is just a grasshopper shedding its old skin. I see an awful lot of internet projects go exact down this exact same path. They shed the skin, but they're the same content, the same processes underneath. Nothing changes. It might look better, but the actual underlying benefit, that's just not there. So you've got to be thinking, well, what are the benefits of the new? And then get it into, process, into, into place. And equally important to ask and ask early, what are the trade-offs? Because there is always a trade-off. You know, we have limited resources. There's always only go, well, I could be wrong here, but you know, there's pretty much at the moment only 24 hours in a day. It runs, you know, and we go from one day to the next. So if we're going to have a social intranet and we're going to get people actively participating in ways never happened before in the business, where's that time coming from? What doesn't get done anymore? It could be there are things that would be better off not being done. 400 new emails a day is not a happy culture. So maybe there should be an aggressive effort to change that, to free up the time. But if you don't think about where this time's coming from, again, either it won't work because people won't have the time to participate. So beyond that initial fad, it will just wither and die. And I've seen a lot of social initiatives suffer from a lack of momentum six, nine months down the line. You know, it goes down to the next level then. It starts to consume cost. You know, how much is it going to cost to deliver this? Not just put the internet in place, but going forward, there is a maintenance cost with internet. And we're not talking about upgrading the servers. Or the, side of it. the content will get old. It will degrade. How do you clean it up? Who's going to do that? I was with a client just a few weeks ago. I'll try not to name names. Though, quite honestly, if you just look on LinkedIn, it's usually who I've just recently connected to on LinkedIn. It's not got it all benefits. But this client desperately needed a new intranet. And so I was engaged to help them. They're going through a massive shift. Well, a massive shift legally, in that they legally no longer, well, they legally now no longer exist. They're in the public sector. So as of the 1st of April, the old organization ceased to exist. And a new organization came into its being. And so it was like, well, for that, we need a new intranet. And actually, they do. They genuinely need a new intranet, because all the old systems have got to be moved across. But they would not consider what the trade-offs was. They came up with the requirements. So looking at the current systems, there was a complete lack of classification and life cycle management around their content. It was hard to tell what content was good, what was bad, what was old, what was new. They just didn't really manage it. So they came up with fantastic requirements for how it was they were going to have classification schemes brought in, the world would be happy, everyone can tag everything, and then everything will magically filter. So you hit the page and you see just the documents that you need. It's a fantastic vision. But then it was like, well, who's going to do all that? And they're like, well, I'm not hiring any extra people. I'm like, okay, so are you now going to require the whole business to start understanding your classification schemas? Because they wanted a very rigid schema applied. I went, well, are you going to teach everyone how to tag correctly, or are they going to go default, 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 random, because I've got to pick one, it's mandatory, that'll do. Because that's what you'll get, you know. No metadata is better than bad metadata. Just don't do it if you're not going to put the effort in. But they would not answer this question. And... It really became a bit of a stalemate. And it's partly why we then had to pull back and go, well, what's your vision here? And in the end, it was, well, there was going to be no extra human resource available to do anything around content management. It's like, okay, that scopes how much you can do around content management, but you've got to trade the two off. So we've got a vision. We've got some vague idea, hopefully, of where we're going, but how much is it going to cost? The first aspect, size of the project, and that leads back to the definition of have you defined what you consider internet to be, or at least in this current form, in this current project. If you're going for all four, it's big. <laughs> you know, you're going to need a big budget to go with it. If you're quite specific, you're saying, well, actually, and I've had clients where they just want simple communications. We want a frequently answered question, asked questions page with answers that are kept up to date and nothing more. Quite simple, quite narrow. That's obviously a much cheaper project to deliver than if they're going for a complete business transformation. But 
what is very difficult here is to engage outside consultants to come in and say, well, how much should we spend on all this? It's really for the business to decide how big a project you're tackling and what you're prepared to commit to. It comes back to that commitment to change. You have to have a feel for what you want to spend. Because the other challenge is, is when it comes down to specifics, what comes first? Is it the requirements or the budget? It is a little bit like chicken and egg because trying to get how many requirements, if you don't know them yet, you can't give an accurate cast figure of how much it's going to cost. But then you might not know how much it's going to cost until you've got the requirements that you know what you want to deliver. So it can be a little bit of a round robin situation. Obviously, an approach to take is to gather requirements, get some. But this is not always as easy as it sounds in theory. There's, very, there's many different methods to do this. You can have surveys, interviews, focus groups, ask people, observe what they're doing, use statistics. <laughs> The first three can give you a feel for what people would like to see or would like to do with their internet, but they're rarely accurate because it's back to that previous slide in terms of effort. We tend to envisage a fabulous solution without any concern for how it gets to be a fabulous solution. I think there's probably a handful of you here that were in that uh, lunchtime session uh, that Web Trends just delivered, where he'd, and he was very honest. You know, he'd got some fabulous... Excel spreadsheets up that, you know, with all graphics and they looked fantastic. But he was very honest to say, you know, it would take me a long time to deliver this spreadsheet. And then got, you got your nice plain black and white columns, rows, no visuals whatsoever. You know, it's just, I in my head can envisage a dashboard very, very quickly, but the effort to get the underlying detail in so it actually comes to life and works, there's a lot that goes on in the background. So you can get a feel, but you will not really get strong requirements from the majority of interviews, in my experience. The two stronger methods are observing what people do and thinking, why on earth do they do that, and finding out ways to do it better. And it can simply be sitting with them and watching where they navigate through on the internet. Where do they start? What are they typically looking for? How frustrating is it for them to get to where they need to be? That will give you good requirements very, very quickly. And statistics. Statistics are the other one too. Look at your, if you've got an existing internet, and by this point in time, most people should have something in place. They're not breaking new ground here. Look at the statistics of the current one. You know, what are the most frequently accessed areas? Where do people start? Most, even in SharePoint 2010, even SharePoint managed to give you some basics around well, where did they go next from this page? Where did they come from? So you could start to plot. And I'll often work with a client on this and show the statistics because they will talk about the home page. The communications team will come up with a great visual for the newsletter and everything that's going to go on the home page. And then I'll point out that 87% of all traffic goes to the little search box in the top right corner. Uh, that's where everybody goes on their home page. So it's the statistics prove it. And the beauty of that is you get some data behind the vision then because it's a vision backed up by solid data, you know. 90% of all traffic on our current internet goes straight through the staff directory. They're looking for people. And I actually see that that's a fairly on the mark statistic for most internets I've looked at on the stats front. People either go straight to the search box, or if you've got a staff directory search box on the page, they go there first and type people's names in. Contact details are the most frequently sought information on pretty much every internet I've ever come across. So you have this stunning visual for the home page, and then one little box in the corner is where everybody's going. Use the stats to justify why that should change, and you need a different home page. That's the chicken side, but then there's also the egg side, which is the budget, you know, the resources to deliver. And again, when you say, well, how much is this going to cost? It, the consultant answer of, well, it depends, is, is on the button. There's no easy answer here, because how deep do you go with technology? Obviously, there's hardware, but are we talking about installation, setup, configuration? Are you going to be doing custom development? What about business continuity, backup, restore plans, network infrastructure? Are you hosting it online, on site? There's, you, know, you need to start to give some idea of how deep you're going. Content's the biggie, because does the content already exist? There's another classic where you'll see beautiful wireframe mock-ups of the new internet, and then you go, well, where's that content today? Oh, oh well, we don't actually do that yet. It's like, so who's going to? You know, because we'd better start giving it a go, see if it works, see if anybody reads it. Don't spend a fortune and then find that actually nobody clicks on the links and nothing changes. You see an awful lot of plans around mythical content that's never yet been created. So are we talking about creating the content? What about existing content? Are we going to cleanse it? Is it going to need to be migrated? Is it going to have to be updated in the process? Is that being costed as part of this project or a future project? You know, there's a lot of considerations here. If somebody can give you a quick figure, specific figure, for budget, 
hold them to it, <laughs> unless you don't like the number. Because and that's what I do. If a client insists on having a set number without having any detail around what they really require, I'll just think of a number that I think is roughly for the size. And again, with all things, it becomes instinctive. Once you've done a few, you can generally have a judgment. You know, just as an architect would be able to give you an approximate cost for different sizes and types of buildings. The same is true of software projects. But then I'll stick an extra naught on the end of it and make it silly. And they'll go, well, that's ridiculous. And so, well, you know, it's kind of without the requirements. Who knows? Because it could go on and on and on. I have had, I mean, and this is from, learnt from bitter experience, because I had one client a long, long time ago that I hadn't thought about content migration. I hadn't quoted it in the scope. And they thought that it was just going to get, it, they would click some links and the suppliers were going to do all the content for them. It's not something you want to experience halfway through the project and realise that's, that's not been thought about. Uh, the silly side story, I mean, it happens in building projects all the time. Uh, my house where I now live, was it was a shell when I bought it. It had been derelict for about 50 years, so you can imagine the state it was in. Uh, and so it's completely, it wasn't flattened, but we, we did it back up, but it was pretty much gutted and built back up. And we did pick the builder with the best quote, it has to be said, because it was looking a pretty hefty project. Um, he forgot to include the stairs uh, in his quote. Um, and he took the old stairs out and then explained to us how he hadn't included the new stairs and how it was going to cost an extra £15,000 was going to have to come from somewhere. And it was like, you can put the old stairs back then. Um, because how could you have taken them out not knowing what was going to go in their place? You know, were we going to levitate up to the next floor? Um, so it happens in all projects across all walks of life. But, you know, it's something... This is why to have a specific number at the start is very, very difficult. It makes far more sense to have that vision have an outline of what you think you're prepared to invest to achieve that vision, and the rest is going to be a balancing act to get there. And that's why I tend to use this analogy a lot. I say internets, they're a lot more like gardens than buildings. With buildings, there's a lot of specifics, and so you shouldn't forget the stairs. You know, there's structures, they're going to have a roof. There's a whole gamut where you can be quite predictable about what it's going to be, whereas a garden is a blank canvas. You know, it's like, okay, here's my backyard. What should we put in it? What do you want? How much do you want to spend is the first thing that the landscape garden will say. And it's a good approach because it immediately starts to frame what you can get because anything's possible with a garden. Do you want a fully formed garden or are you prepared to put up with little seedlings and young trees for a number of years to establish because that would be a lot cheaper? And it's the same with content. If you think when you sketch out plans for a garden, here we're being quite specific visually, but even here, a good landscape garden would start saying, well, you know, here are the buckets, the price ranges for this price. You can have this, but we're going to start with you know, six-month-old trees. They're going to be this big. They don't look like that yet. They'll look like that in about 30 years' time. You know, or we can actually, there are garden centres that will sell you part-grown trees, so it will look nearer here, but they cost a lot more. So you can see it's a constant negotiation, which is much more accurate of how internet projects tend to work. You have that vision, but it's a constant balancing act of, well, we can go down that path, but this path's more expensive. Or we can go down this path, it's quicker, but there's going to be more work down the line. You might find you've got another project in the future coming up to tackle some of the things you just can't fit in to that first project. The other reason why the garden analogy is also, I love it for internet, is this. This is a pretty garden. You know, it's a nice garden. The flower is in bloom and it's green. It's got an ongoing cost. It's back to that budget question between implementation and how much it's going to cost running it through its course of its lifespan. Because gardens don't look pretty without a lot of care and attention. And it's another challenge where there's similarities with intranets, is that a gardener can't tell you exactly how much it's going to cost to maintain. It depends. It depends on the weather. If you had created a garden in this country two years ago, pretty much to today, you'd have been watering it all the time because we had a year of relatively dry weather, which is quite unusual for this country. And, you know, I mean, to the point we had a drought declared around about the last couple of, this week or last of last year. The day after the drought was declared, as those of you from this country know well, it started to rain and it hasn't stopped raining until this week, weirdly. I mean, it's like there's been shadows on the ground in the last two days. It's like, oh, what are you? So... <laughs> The cost to maintain a garden has a lot of external factors that influence it heavily. And the same is true of an internet. A social internet, there's a lot of people involved. They are going to have a lot of influence. Communications, there's a lot of content involved. You can't give and say, right, it's going to cost you this much a year to run. The techie stuff, absolutely. You can scope, you can do all your capacity planning, scope the hardware, the software, the licenses, but that's not the true cost of the internet. The true cost is making your garden still look like a garden 
and not turn into a backyard full of weeds. So you've got loads of requirements. You've kind of got a rough idea of what to spend, but no specifics. How do you figure out what to do first? And it really always should come back to some return on investment. And there always should be a return on investment. Because if there isn't any return on investment, all you've done is added more costs to the business. And nobody's going to thank you for that. So the return doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. But there has to be some return. It's back to what are the benefits? Why are we doing all of this? There are oodles of different methods, calculations, formulas for, for giving you accurate, you know, this is the predicted amount it's going to cost, this is the value, this is the risk. Uh, they are wholly unreliable for intranets. They are nothing better than crystal ball gazing because you have, you've got so many variables, people being the big one. There's an awful lot of assumptions, a lot of variables, the numbers, the... No, I won't use that joke. <laughs> I was going to use an economic joke, which would have been very bad. This is a much woollier approach, but will get you in more accurate results. Two axes, importance, practicality. How important is this requirement to our vision, to the project? How practical is, is it to deliver? And obviously, there's a correlation there. More practical generally means cheaper, quicker, easier. More impractical, it's harder. It's going to take a lot more effort to deliver. And it's plot all your different requirements, scope them all out, and then the simple rule of thumb, stretch my legs a little bit, is dark blue, do these, because they are highly important to the business. They're quite practical, so they're, they're achievable. Good return on investment. We like everything in the dark blue. Consider everything in the light blue, because they're either very important, possibly the most important, but the practicality is going down, which means they're going to be harder to deliver, they're going to take longer to deliver, they're going to consume more resources. And equally, even if it's really, really, really easy, if it's got no importance to anyone, it's still taking up some resource somewhere. So why are you doing it? Well, this, what's not happening? Simple rule of thumb is, this is the point of no return on investment. All you're doing is costing. It's becoming a problem to the business. You're trying to solve one problem, you've created another problem in its place. That's not a good outcome. But with intranets, and in particular, well, with SharePoint and SharePoint-like platforms, there is a dividing line too. You reach a point where no matter how important the requirement is, this is the wrong solution. You're trying to use the wrong tools, the wrong project to solve it. Ditto for the bottom. It's simply the wrong problem. It's of so little importance to anyone, it's not worth doing because it takes the resources away. These are what I would call toxic projects. And there are more of them out there in the world I see than I'd like to. And it's just because we've got one tool and we're going to make that tool be the solution. Be absolutely sure that the requirements haven't shifted into a different area. I'll be revisiting this a little bit on my Wednesday session, taking the more sort of digital strategy approach. But for intranets in particular, because intranets contain lots of different features and capabilities, we can sometimes be a little too tempted to try and solve everything with them. You need to reach a cutoff point, say wrong solution or simply wrong project. Come back later with somebody else's budget. So that leads on to feasibility is what we're trying to do here, feasible. And it's the classic of theory meeting practice. This again brings us back to that original vision. We've got a grand vision, but is it remotely feasible for this organisation at this moment in time to deliver it? And just as with budget and requirements, this is not a straightforward answer. It's a moving target depending on the organisation and its current position. You've got your vision, that should give you a target, but you really need to understand your baseline, particularly on these three axes, in terms of people, process, and content. If your content is down in the red zone and it's in a terrible state, and your vision is the most wonderful content in the world, you've got a long journey. If your content's actually pretty good, you know, you've got a good internet, well managed, and it's further down, then the chances are you're just trying to do something a little different. It's more of an incremental shift. It's a shorter journey. But how big is the jump from where you are today to where you want to be. Is it massive? Is it worlds apart? Is it actually just a short incremental improvement? Because obviously, the shorter, the more feasible to deliver it. The bigger the jump, the more question marks there are going to be in the project. And it's another area to focus which part of the internet to tackle. Back to that idea of defining those four different strands. Could be actually, processes are good. You've got rid of all your paper. Everything's online. Content's kept well managed. It's healthy. But at the moment, people can't find each other. They don't know who knows what, who does what, who to go to for help. So that's an easy indicator 
that the social approach is probably going to bring back the best benefits to the organisation. Equally, you might have an organisation that's small and everybody knows each other very well, but the process is archaic, still all on paper. You know, I see just as much of that too, where actually socially there's very, very good organisation. Tools are not going to make that much difference to how they work, particularly smaller companies where everyone's working in a relatively close proximity, but often they'll still be filling out, you know, booking leave in paper and putting in people's in trays. So that's the target. You know, pick the appropriate target to aim for, but know the baseline before you start. The second aspect of feasibility is your organization's current position. Everything, everything in the world has this rhythmic cycle. We go through periods of relative stability and then periods of sudden disruption. Things tend to cluster. You get a whole phase of bad stuff happen and then it all goes calm again. Most organizations are exactly the same. They're stable for a while and then they go through a massive transformation either by force outside forces necessitate it, or because they choose to, they go through a reorganisation. But where your organisation is, if it's on the stability area versus very disruptive, has a massive influence on intranet projects in particular. If it's stable, the company is sort of humming along, it's very much business as usual. It's actually quite hard to push through radical changes onto your systems if the company's stable, because nobody really has that motivation. It comes back to that commitment to change. Where's the commitment going to come from if everything's fine, everyone's happy, everything's calm? But equally, if they're going through disruption, it's a chaotic time. So then when you start to push things through, it depends on whether what you're trying to offer is the solution they need. You know, are you the priority in this period or not? There may be other projects that are more important. If they are, you're never going to get the attention that you need because there's too much going on. When I've worked with clients doing full-blown SharePoint deployments, you know, we'll actually often scope two to three-year cycle of where they expect to be as an organisation and at which point SharePoint can do something to help. And if they've come and said, well, we want to do a new internet, it's like you're going through a reorg. I mean, we need to do something to improve communications because communications is really important during a reorganisation. But don't throw lots of new toys at people because they're really, they won't care. Uh, you have to rein it right back into a focus that, because they, people are uncertain. Their jobs are changing. They're being relocated. There's so much going on. They're not that bothered about a newsletter, typically. They want to know what's going on and how it impacts them personally. So what can we do to help that? So where your organisation is in terms of stability and disruption will have a big bearing on the success of your internet project. Internets tend to get very badly timed. I almost always see them starting to come in just as an organisation is going through a reorganisation, forced or otherwise, acquisition. It happens a lot. And it's an understandable approach because of the communications angle. But trying to get attention and commitment to the bigger pieces of the project is actually very, very hard during a disruptive phase. Then there's the culture of the organisation. Different organisations have different cultures. Who works... I'm going to sound like Lloyd Grossman for those who <laughs> ever saw the programme a long time ago. Who works in an office like this? <laughs> Anybody want to guess? Come on, it's the afternoon. I can't do all the talking. Somebody shout out a company that this might be their offices. Say again? Microsoft. It's not Microsoft. They do have buildings not dissimilar, but good guess. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, I was so hoping Apple was going to be first. If you've seen the QI program, I want to do the ee, 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 wrong answer. Um, no, it's close to where I live. It's Aston Martin's design headquarters up in Warwickshire. Um, it's a stunning building. You can see, I mean, these are not cheapo fluorescent strip lights at the top here. They're actually suspended, and they're of a brightness that they highlight every floor in the car. So it's completely lit at every possible angle. It's quite amazing. And apparently, the glass, it's the tallest planes of glass that have been installed in the UK. They were specially manufactured. You can imagine the kind of tools they get to play with are probably not the same of the tools if you were working in an office like this. And I, you know, it's a, I joke about it, but I, I listen to people with their visions for an internet, and I look around. I look outside the meeting room at the working environment that the people have to work in physically. It's like, why do you want this digital vision of magnificence when you've got people wrapped up in old desks in little strips you know with the headphones on because it's noisy you know it's, it, should, it needs to align you know your digital tools should align to the culture of the organization if this is about hiring a smarter workforce they're going to want the smartest people possible 
This is about making a cheaper workforce. So the internet should fit. There's a really important message. The culture of the organization should impact the design of the internet. There's another aspect to working environments. I know more and more people are able to work from home, but we do typically still work predominantly in office buildings. And they themselves bring their own challenges to intranets that often don't get thought about. So this, to give my voice a quick rest, I'm just going to play a TED video. Now, it's about sound, so it may sound a bit uh, in a couple of places by design. Let me just... Oh. next five minutes, my intention is to transform your relationship with sound. Let me start with the observation that most of the sound around us is accidental, much of it is unpleasant. We stand on street corners shouting over noise like this and pretending that it doesn't exist. Well, this habit of suppressing sound has meant that our relationship with sound has become largely unconscious. There are four major ways sound is affecting you all the time, and I'd like to raise them in your consciousness today. First is physiological. Sorry about that. I've just given you a shot of cortisol, your fight-flight hormone. Sounds affecting your hormone secretions all the time, but also your breathing, your heart rate, which I just also did, and your brain waves. It's not just unpleasant sounds like that that do it. This is surf. It has a frequency of roughly 12 cycles per minute. Most people find that very soothing, and interestingly, 12 cycles per minute is roughly the frequency of the breathing of a sleeping human. So there's a deep resonance with being at rest. We also associate it with being stress-free and on holiday. The second way in which sound affects you is psychological. Music is the most powerful form of sound that we know that affects our emotional state. This is guaranteed to make most of you feel pretty sad if I leave it on. Music is not the only kind of sound, however, which affects your emotions. Natural sound can do that too. Birdsong, for example, is a sound which most people find reassuring. There's a reason for that. Over hundreds of thousands of years, we've learned that when the birds are singing, things are safe. It's when they stop you need to be worried. The third way in which sound affects you is cognitively. You can't if understand two this people talking at once, on or in this track. case, one person talking Try twice. To the other one. You have to choose which me you're going to listen to. We have a very small amount of bandwidth for processing auditory input, which is why noise like this is extremely damaging to productivity. If you have to work in an open plan office like this, your productivity is greatly reduced. And whatever number you're thinking of, it probably isn't as bad as this. You are one third as productive in open plan offices as in quiet rooms. And I have a tip for you. If you have to work in spaces like that, carry headphones with you with a soothing sound like birdsong, put them on, and your productivity goes back up to triple what it would be. It's a great video, and that is actually only a slice of it. It's available on YouTube, as all the TED Talks are, and I highly recommend it. It's something I rarely see considered in most, whether they're internet, social, collaborative product, projects, people thinking about the working environment. You think a 66% reduction in productivity for a noisy open plan office. Open plan offices are typically 20% cheaper to build than closed offices. It's partly why they're popular. They're cheap. It's the cheaper workforce approach. Well, if you're losing that much productivity, the next time somebody like me or any of the other presenters that are in the room, we all specialize in tools to help improve productivity. Forget us, improve your office. Tell us to come back next year when you fix that one, because actually you'll probably get more value from designing a nicer working environment than from any technology tool on the productive front. It's a little bit controversial. It's a very, very good video. So, commitment to change is the other aspect of the feasibility because it's the biggie of those first three points at the start of the slides. This little puppy, email, will it ever die? <laughs> Most of us, <laughs> we can hope. There are some organizations that are trying hard to not use email anymore. There's a, uh, a guy with an IBM, he tweets very regularly and he, he has a no email policy. He does everything through instant messaging and other forms of communications, but we drown in it. But that said, it's wholly effective, because why else do we use it? I mean, there's got to be some trade-off here that we feel is beneficial. Every time people put blocks in the way or barriers up for what people need to do to get their job done, they will circumvent it through email. It's a bit like access permissions for content. Great, off it goes by email. Close that provider through the firewall. Don't worry, another one will pop up. And now we've got cloud, it gets even better. can log in anywhere, pretty much. You know, we, email is that catch-all workaround for everything we don't like with the tools. So that it's not going to go away. And if you know people are going to keep defaulting back, be aware, you know, is your requirements, are you asking for such a big step change 
that it would be too much and people will pull back to the defaults. But there's another aspect too. And this is a quote that I've, I've used a lot with knowledge management systems, it has to be said, and projects over the last, well, gosh, back in the 90s, this was a popular one, because it's so true. I will go into clients talking, who were talking about an internet project, and then I'll say, well, are you going to do all this? Oh, God, no, that's for other people to take care of. You know, they're, they, they're not buying into the system themselves. If there's anything about your working environment where you've got symbols strengthening your ladder, your hierarchy, the, <laughs> the better paid to the lower paid, that will create any barrier to work, and an internet won't change that, and technology won't solve that. So be aware, because it all comes down to what was the value. Was this project worth doing? You know, did you have that problem to solve? Did you have the commitment to change? And this one really is around commitment to change, because if not, you could have a fantastic intranet at the end of the project, but no outcome, and that is not a good point to be. Okay, but fourth part of the first part, of this series, we're pretty much on time. I ought to also tackle why SharePoint? It's, we're all here, you know, why use SharePoint for an internet and should you? There are common reasons, quite bland ones, it would have to be said. You've already got the licenses. This is probably the most popular reason for saying you're going to use SharePoint for your internet. It's licensed, standardized on Microsoft software. In many cases now, particularly it's been around a while, there's previous experience with SharePoint. But these are actually, they're not unreasonable points to make. If you've got availability of skills and expertise around SharePoint, it's not a bad decision to consider a technology that you know you can manage. So these are not bad reasons. A lot of people say, oh, well, we should have done a full vendor analysis. You know, why have we chosen this and not that? Not necessarily. It comes back to that vision. You know, it's all about the vision and the outcomes. Don't turn it into a massive thing about the technology. So if you've got simple reasons for SharePoint, fine. It's more about Deciding between a platform, and SharePoint's a platform, or an application that has a specific focus and a specific type of intranet or capability that goes on to an intranet. And by platform, SharePoint is obviously a biggie, but so from IBM, Oracle, even Google, Google Apps, you know, platforms provide a range of features across a number of different capabilities. Uh, now, this is the intranet page for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Is anybody here from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport? Thank God, because it's not what I asked. It's, uh, it's, on, it's on the internet. It's another one stolen from the internet so that you can read upon it after. It's actually quite an interesting case study. This is their brand spanking new intranet. Uh, it costs £15,000 to develop, they say, on their blog. Uh, a fraction of the cost of their previous intranet, which they don't name or shame. And it's going to cost 10% of the prior running costs to keep it going. So that's development, hosting, fees, and so forth. Uh, this is not running on SharePoint. It's running on WordPress. Anyone here heard of WordPress? Yeah, it's, I, anybody run blogs and stuff on WordPress? You're going to have a blog, quite frankly, put it on WordPress. It's way better than some of the other tools. Uh, that's actually fine. I, I talk with clients, and then we have a lengthy conversations about the use of tools such as WordPress for an intranet. It works for this, because this is a communications intranet, and it's publishing information. The challenge comes is, what if they decide they want to go social? Then are they going to start experimenting with Yammer, perhaps, or Jive software, for example? They might look at the tools like Huddle, which does team-based collaboration. You know, what if they decide they want to go through more process automation? What tools, you know, web trends and like, might, might want to be plugged in? When you work with applications, it's great for a specific purpose, but the complexity starts to rise very quickly when you start to spread out into other areas. Because each application has got its own authentication, its own identity, access permissions models, and so forth. So it's not that one's better or the other, it's that they are designed for different purposes. So be aware if you're choosing one over the other. The key part with a platform really is shared services. So look at the Microsoft platform. Your identity is managed in Active Directory in Windows. You can be put into groups. Those groups then work across Exchange for the email, the messaging, the calendar. They work across SharePoint for access to sites and so forth. So it's one identity very quickly spreading across all others. You can integrate other systems, of course, through single sign-on tools, but you add complexity to the solution. You get things like a common user interface. So that means that as you build out different areas, it kind of looks and works and feels the same. So that lowers the training. It's, you know, it makes it easier for people to adopt new elements if you're expanding the internet. And it's got common engineering, so the different tools tend to plug in very easily. You lose a lot of this when you go for an application. but always a trade-off. Applications will almost always give you richer features for the specific scenarios that they're good at. So it's the difference between whether you're looking for a multi-purpose solution 
or a specific focus. Platforms are all about multiple purposes. So if somebody came to me with a requirement for an intranet, wanting to use SharePoint, and their absolute only plans were for frequently asked questions, an FAQ style page, we'd like to use a wiki type approach, let everybody update it, oh, quite reasonable, it'd be a useful tool. I would only suggest SharePoint if they were already using SharePoint for other things. It would be overkill if that were their only focus. Pick an application that can do it if you've got the skills to back it up. And that's where it really does need to align with the IT strategy. You know, and IT can be beaten up an awful lot in terms of a lot of projects within businesses, but they've got to run the stuff once it's in place. They've got to make sure it's available. They've got to be legally compliant. There's, they've got all the corporate gump that hopefully gets abstracted away as much as possible from the end user. So what is the overall strategy? If you're an organization that likes to go best of breed, then probably actually an application focus is going to be more your thing. You pick the different tools. Yes, there's going to be an overhead. It's more complicated. There's going to be a cost tying them in together. But you get best of breed tools if that's what you want. If you know you're going to have multiple different uses from the start and you want to keep it, things simple and consistent, well, a platform's going to aid. But the balance is going to need to be on the requirements because if you've got this perfect idea in your head for how set a blog's going to run, a blog is far easier to enrich on WordPress than SharePoint's approach to blogging. And I am, confess, I'm not a fan of some of SharePoint's social tools. I mean, the blog feature, I don't know if they could make any more disgusting length URLs than they already do. Uh, if you ever go to a site, you'll know a blog on the, on the web, just look at the URL in the address bar. If it's like run off the screen, it's probably SharePoint. I get a bit ranty about the URLs in SharePoint. But that's the thing. But users don't really care about that stuff. But you have to keep it simple. So if they say, well, why haven't we got this? I've, got, I've seen that blog over there, and it's got all these cool things. Why can't we have it? It should depend on the strategy. And it's, say, it's not about right or wrong. It's about consistency, because it's back to that shared vision. You're going to go off track very quickly if you try and satisfy every what-if scenario. SharePoint as a platform obviously spans a whole range of stuff. You've got things like formal content right through into some of the social elements that it includes. The typical rule of thumb is this end is more managed, but as you go more into the people side, you need to be adaptable. So it starts to be used for very, very different purposes. It is part of a platform. So I've already mentioned there's Exchange in there that does all the email, the messaging, and the calendaring. You've got Link for your instant messaging. You've got Windows, which is the base. You know, Without Windows, it would be really scuppered. It would need its own identity system. And the new kid on the block over at the end, SkyDrive, which is causing all sorts of fun in terms of decisions around content management. All part of the platform. One identity, bump, and you get access to the lot. That's how platforms work. I should add, I've not put Yammer on here for a good reason. Why is Yammer not listed with the platform, even though it's owned by Microsoft? Indeed, Yammer is not a platform. It's not in the platform. It's an application. It's got its own authentic. You can set up Yammer without using any of the Microsoft products. You know, it's got, you've got to set all the login accounts. You've got to sort out the different missions and so forth. So at the moment, it's an application. It's going into the platform, and Microsoft's been very clear communicating about this. I think uh, authentication integration, I think, is targeted for October of this year. At that point, it gets its place on the list. It becomes part of the platform. But it's the difference between the two. OK, scarily, I'm on time, which either means I've spoken too fast and talked too much, which is quite possible. But quick wrap up for this session. All we've got at this point is set expectations. And I say it until the cows come home, literally. Communicate a shared vision, whether it's platform, whether it's application, whether it's big change, whether it's a specific focus area. And I perhaps should have mentioned that PwC uh, case study, the links will be shared uh, on the slides afterwards, uh, they're not actually using SharePoint for that social initiative. They're using Jive. So they're using a different tool. Yeah, a few raised eyebrows there. I am mixed, I have to say, on Jive, but it's a personal preference thing. Um, but it's an application approach. They don't talk about the rest of their internet. I would assume the rest is running on a platform. And we'll talk a little bit more about those decision points just towards the end in part three, because sometimes you will end up with a mix of both. You'll have a base platform. There are times when actually you will want to drop in applications depending on the focus. So problem to solve. Know what you're trying to solve with your internet project. You really do need a strong commitment to change, or it won't. There won't be any change. And the big one is sufficient resources. You know, if it doesn't look like you've got sufficient resources, something's got to give. Either find more resources or scale down some of the requirements. But try and get those expectations set and communicated as early as possible. 
The biggest gain here is it helps resolve conflicts through the project because every time you get that what if question, you can come back to the vision. Does it help or hinder? And if it's hindering, then get rid of it, resolve the conflict. And that's the fourth point. That's where your stakeholders should come in because they should nip those requirements in the bud very quickly. Okay, that leaves, I've got slides, references on the end, but that's really there for the slides afterwards. That leaves a good, ooh, not much time at all. So I'm watching the time I've lapsed, forgetting that we've probably started a little late. We've got about just over five minutes for any questions at this stage on this part. Any questions? <laughs>